today we are talking about antecedent interventions, chapter 23. First, we'll start with the conceptual understanding of antecedent interventions. Antecedent-based behavior change strategies have all been classified under single terms. These terms include antecedent procedures, antecedent control, antecedent manipulations, and antecedent interventions. And these actually all have different meanings and functions. So SDs, or discriminative stimulus, tell the learner that reinforcement is available when they exhibit a particular behavior. And they've made that connection based on history of reinforcement. And manipulating motivating operation, or MOs, can also increase the frequency of the behavior. So again, we're talking about satiation and deprivation. And each one, the stimulus, discriminative, and the motivating operation have different implications of how they implement behavior change and manipulate the environment. And now we're going to talk about classifying functions of antecedents. And there are two different categories for functions of antecedent stimuli. There's the contingency dependent and the contingency independent. For the contingency dependent, antecedent event is dependent on the consequences of behavior for developing evocative and abative effects. So that means all stimulus control functions and they're referred to as antecedent control. For contingency independent, this means that the antecedent event does not depend on the consequences of behavior to develop these evocative and abative effects. The antecedent itself that's in place is um, affects the behavior consequence relations. Um, motivating operations are considered to be contingency independent, and they're referred to as antecedent interventions. And we'll talk about more examples later on. So now let's talk about the antecedent intervention. And antecedent interventions have abolishing operations. So if you remember from, I believe, chapter 16 on motivating operations, an abolishing operation would decrease that need to exhibit a behavior because that function would have already been met. And antecedent interventions can be used in isolation by themselves or in a combination like a treatment package. Remember we talked about a treatment package is including extinction, differential reinforcement, etc. Um, and it also decreases the effectiveness of reinforcers that maintain the problem behavior. So again, abolishing operation is saying they don't need to exhibit that problem behavior um, because that function has already been met. Um, the effects of motivating operations are not permanent, right? So if a motiva motivating operation is somebody was hungry, um, then food becomes an effective and increased um, effectiveness reinforcer, that will come back, right? Because they will become hungry again. So with that being said, because it's not permanent, right? It won't produce permanent behavior changes or improvements in behavior. Um, it can be used at the same time to reduce problem behavior. And again, it's part of a treatment package, right? There are three types of antecedent interventions with established experimental results. And those three are non-contingent reinforcement, or NCR, high probability request sequence, and functional communication training, or FCT. So let's start with non-contingent reinforcement, also noted as NCR. And remember, an NCR is an antecedent intervention. And the definition of NCR is stimuli with known reinforcing properties are delivered on a fixed time or variable time schedule independent of the learner's behavior. So we're delivering known reinforcers independent of the behavior.
NCR is effective in decreasing problem behaviors because the reinforcers that have maintained the problem behavior are actually available freely and frequently. So again, we want to make sure we know what the function is. Um, it functions as an abolishing operation, and it's also referred to as presenting stimuli with known reinforcing properties. There are three distinct procedures that identify and deliver stimuli with known reinforcing properties. Those three known reinforcing properties are positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and automatic reinforcement. Let's discuss NCR with positive reinforcement. In this 2000 study, this study showed the use of positive reinforcement, such as attention and food, for three individuals with developmental disabilities, and they use it as an antecedent intervention to decrease problem behavior. And then they found that positive reinforcement was what maintained these behaviors during the analysis. So basically, the non-contingent reinforcement of attention and food, not dependent on the problem behaviors, decreased the problem behaviors. And then we have NCR with negative reinforcement. In this 2003 study by Kodak, Miltenberger, and Romaniuk, they used negative reinforcement, a break from instructional request, for two individuals with autism as an antecedent intervention. Um, and this decreased the problem behaviors that they found during the analysis to be maintained by negative reinforcement or escape. So in other words, they gave them a break from demands on a non-contingent reinforcement schedule. And as a result, it increased their compliance and decreased their problem behaviors. And now we'll discuss NCR with automatic reinforcement. In 2003, this study by Lindbergh et al. And this study demonstrated that the use of automatic reinforcement in the form of physical manipula manipulation of highly preferred leisure items for two individuals with intellectual disability to decrease SIBs or self-injurious behaviors that were maintained by automatic reinforcement. So basically they delivered um, the manipulation of items on a fixed schedule, uh, independent of the behaviors, and ultimately that led to the reduction of self-injurious behaviors. There are three key elements to enhance the effectiveness of NCR. And the first one is the amount and quality of stimuli with known reinforcing properties influence the effectiveness of NCR. So again, knowing what's that maintaining reinforcer and then the quality and the effectiveness of how we're delivering that reinforcer. Another key element is to remember that most treatments include extinction with NCR interventions. So you have to make sure you're placing that maladaptive behavior on extinction for NCR to work more effectively. And the third suggestion and a key element is that reinforcer preferences can change during the intervention. So the NCR stimuli may not continue competing with the reinforcers that maintain the problem behavior. So it's recommended that you periodically use a variety of available stimuli with the NCR intervention to reduce problems of changing preferences. And it's important to use the information that you've collected through your functional behavior assessment to really identify what's maintaining those behaviors. It's important to match the NCR schedule and the reinforcement to the correct function of the behavior. Um, this study in 2001 basically summarizes that it's important for your NCR schedule to be much more denser than when it's not on an NCR schedule. So in other words, you want to make sure that your baseline, um, you've collected appropriate baseline and that your NCR schedule is denser than your baseline schedule, right? So if I know that a student exhibits uh, quote unquote attention seeking behaviors every five minutes, I'm going to want my NCR schedule for attention to be every four minutes. And that's what 
serves that abolishing operation. Ringdahl also suggested three procedures for emphasizing reinforcement during the NCR intervention. And the first one would be to increase the delivery of stimuli with known reinforcing properties or the reinforcer, um, use an obliviously different schedule of reinforcement at treatment onset, um, such as continuous reinforcement, and then combine differential reinforcement of other behavior or the GRO with the NCR treatment package. Um, and this will decrease um, like accidental reinforcement of the problem behavior um, from the time-based NCR schedule. And now I'll talk about the time schedules of NCR. The most common time schedule would be a fixed time schedule. So that would say every minute I'm going to deliver attention. Um, you can also use a variable time schedule. So that would say every three to five minutes I'm gonna deliver attention. Um, but making sure that you're establishing the appropriate schedule because you don't want to make the interval too long and you don't want to make the interval too short. So it's really kind of finding that sweet spot as far as when to reinforce. It is recommended to start with a dense schedule of reinforcement first. Um, so a dense fixed time interval or a variable time schedule. So that basically means that your um, intervals are going to start off shorter and then you can increase. Um, you might want to start off with a fixed time schedule before moving to a variable time schedule. Um, this can be done arbitrarily, so just picking a time, um, but it is more effective to base that interval based on the number of occurrences of the problem behavior within a certain time frame. So to determine the initial NCR schedule, you're going to calculate the total duration of your observation and divide that by the total number of occurrences of the problem behavior. And then you'd set the initial interval at or slightly below that quotient. So let's say in 60 minutes, I observed six um, <clears throat> incidents of aggression. So 60 divided by six, will tell me that it happens once every 10 minutes. So I'm going to set my initial NCR schedule at nine minutes or maybe even eight minutes. And then I would deliver whatever that maintaining reinforcer is at that fixed time. So if it was for attention, I'm going to deliver attention um, every eight minutes. So let's talk about the different ways you can thin time-based schedules. You can do this by adding small increments of time to the NCR interval. So increasing by 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, etc. And the best time to increase an NCR interval is after the current interval has produced um, success or reduction in the problem behavior. And this can be accomplished using three different procedures. And these are the constant time increases, proportional time increases, and session to session time increase or decrease. So in a constant time increase, you're increasing the fixed time or the variable time schedule intervals by using a constant duration of time. So you're just saying each time we're adding five seconds, um, regardless of their performance. Um, you decrease the amount of time the individual has access to the reinforcer by a concentration of time. So maybe you'll increase the interval and then you'll decrease access to the reinforcer. In a proportional time increase, you can increase the fixed time or variable time schedule proportionately, um, meaning that each time the schedule interval is increased by the same proportion of time. So an example would be each time the interval is increased by 5%. So if you have 60 seconds as the initial fixed time schedule, the first schedule increased by 90 seconds, 5% of 60 seconds, and then the second increase would be 135 seconds, so that'd be 5% of the 90 second interval. And in a session to session time increase or decrease, you can use the learner's performance to change the schedule interval based on a session to session. 
For example, at the end of a session, you establish a new NCR time, NCR time interval for the next session by dividing the number of problem behaviors that occurred during that session um, by the duration of the session. And then it's kind of like you're finding a new baseline, right? So you can decrease the interval if the problem behavior is increasing. Um, and then the duration of the NCR interval can be increased again after they've shown some success. Additional considerations for NCR would include the following. And one consideration would be setting a terminal criteria. So we usually select an arbitrary terminal criterion for NCR schedule thinning. And in a study in 2000, they reported that um, a five minute fixed time schedule has been commonly used in applied research and that it seemed to be a practical and effective criterion. Um, also, they reported that research has not established an advantage for a terminal criterion of a five minute fixed interval, fixed time schedule over denser schedules or thinner schedules. So again, it's just kind of an arbitrary number. You would establish what that criterion is for your specific client. And then you want to weigh the possible advantages against possible disadvantages before deciding to use an NCR schedule with any type of individual. On page 492 in your text in table 23.3, list the possible advantages and disadvantages of NCR. So I'd make sure to go back and read those. So again, please make sure to review the table in your text, table 23.3, that talks about the possible advantages and disadvantages of NCR.